Hi, my name is Karina Patel, and I'm an associate professor at UT MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas. And this is my abstract um, that was presented at EHA, Idacaptogene Biclusal versus Standard Regimens in Patients with Triple Class Exposed Relapse Refractory Multiple Myeloma, a Karma 3 Analysis in High-Risk Subgroups. My disclosures, and just a quick introduction. So we know that patients with relapse refractory multiple myeloma, especially when they have been triple class exposed, um, tend to have poor prognosis uh, for any subsequent therapy. And outcomes in patients with higher risk disease characteristics, such as cytogenic abnormalities, advanced disease stage, high tumor burden, presence of extramedullary plasmacytomas, and triple class refractory disease remain poor. Um, so in Ida cells, KARMA-3 study, which was the first randomized CAR-T study looking at standard of care versus CAR-T, the overall response was actually 71% versus 42% for patients getting CAR-T. And the median PFS was 13.3 months for CAR-T patients versus those who received standard of care 4.4 months. So that standard of care being 4.4 months was lower than what was expected. Um, but now we know that the majority of the patients on the study were actually considered high risk in different categories. And so we are looking at those patients in, in a little bit more detail here. Um, again, 386 patients, um, patients were randomized two to one for IDASEL versus standard of care. And those patients who got IDASEL, um, who were, stand, who were uh, randomized to IDASEL, um, would undergo leukophoresis, get an optional bridging uh, cycle um, of one or less cycles of any of the standard of care regimens that were allowed on study, and then went on to um, infusion with LDC chemo, followed by infusion of the CAR T cells at 150 to 450 million cells. For patients who were randomized to standard of care, we had five options. So DPD, DVD, IRD, KD, or EPD. And these are all potential options um, that were you know, available in both US, Europe, and other countries since this was an international study. And so really it depended on what the patient had had previously and what their last line of therapy was. So with that, just looking at the different characteristics that we considered high-risk subgroups. So high-risk cytogenetics, classically 17P, translocation 414, and translocation 1416 is what we use. We know data about 1Q and that those patients are probably also you know, high risk, but we didn't have enough data to really include them in this analysis. RIS is stage three disease. Again, we usually don't do this except at diagnosis, but for most of our clinical trials, relapse refractory patients, we are required to submit this data and potentially we can use as a, a biomarker down the road. High tumor burden, meaning greater than 50% myeloma in the bone marrow. Extra medullary disease includes soft tissue only, but um, paramedullary plasma cytomas as well. And then triple class um, refractory, really refractory to at least one image PI and C30 antibody. And so there's a lot of data here, but really this, this chart um, um, shows that baseline characteristics were generally balanced between treatment arms of all the different high-risk subgroups, as well as the overall population. And in terms of prior treatment, again, most of these patients all had a median prior lines of three um, treatments. And you can see that median time to progression was pretty similar for all the different um, um, high-risk subgroups um, for you know, last prior antimyeloma therapy. And majority of these patients were triple class refractory for all the different groups. Um, and again, the median time to progression for last prior regimen was less than seven months in all these high-risk subgroups. So we already knew for their last line that these were more high-risk patients. So here is the PFS curves for the five subgroups, as well as the overall um, KARMA-3 data at the very top left. Um, PFS was the main uh, endpoint that we were looking at in the sub-analysis. And as you can see, 0.49 was that hazard ratio for overall for all patients. And the high-risk subgroups from high-risk cytogenetics at 0.61 um, hazard ratio, meaning that 49% of patients were actually, um, there's a reduction of 49% of progression or death for the high-risk cytogenetic groups getting the CAR-T versus standard of care versus, you know, RSS stage three disease. Um, again, this is a small number of patients and the original trial was not, um, you know, powered to look at this, but 5.2 versus three months. 
And then, of course, you can see the other high tumor burden at 0.6, um, extramedullary plasma cytoma hazard ratio 0.4, and triple class refractory disease, again, 0.46. So overall, mostly greater than 50% reduction uh, for many of these categories or 40% reduction in progression or death compared to standard of care. So again, um, successfully being able to treat our high-risk category patients a little bit better than what our standard of care options are. And so then looking at the best overall response, again, this is an intention to treat population. So patients who may be collected and, and weren't able to get to the actual cell infusion, or even those who maybe had manufacturing issues, which we didn't really see too much of, but those patients were included in this. And so looking at all patients, response rates were really a difference of 30% for all um, of, of CAR-T versus standard of care. 27% for high-risk cytogenetics, 17% for ISS stage three, 12% for high tumor burden, um, extra medullary plasma cytomas, 37%, and triple class refractory, a difference of 33% in the response um, rates for the CAR-T versus standard of care. Again, everything was overall improved in RISS stage three. Obviously, there were um, not as many patients and high tumor burden. We know that that takes a lot longer to completely clear. So you can see the difference in CR was probably a little bit better for CAR-T and the rates of CR for all the subgroups were better for CAR-T versus standard of care. So better depth of response. And the other really cool thing we got to do is soluble BCMA levels. So again, meeting more biomarkers, not just for high-risk patients, for all patients, especially as we have new BCMA-directed therapies and trying to figure out sequencing, we were able to show that all patients um, um, on the trial, you know, had similar levels of soluble BCMA at screening um, for the CAR-T versus standard of care patients. But for all the different groups, um, including the high-risk subgroups, you see this nadir that is much, much lower with the CAR-T group versus the standard of care group. And when patients are progressing at PD, you see a lower level of soluble BCMA compared to those patients who are standard of care. So again, is this more of a tumor burden? You know, is it really showing us any kind of uh, BCMA decrease of expression? I will say anecdotally, I, I think this is more that tumor burden comes back slowly. And um, we've seen that patients who have high risk disease going into CAR-T when they relapse, all of a sudden it's a little bit more treatable and easier to treat. Um, again, we need more studies to prove that, but I don't think this is because we are, we're losing BCMA at progression necessarily. Um, so again, some, some great uh, translational work to, to move forward with. And in terms of safety in general, this was consistent between the treatment arms and high-risk subgroups um, and, and actually a little bit lower risk of CRS compared to patients who are on later line, like in Karma. Um, but again, not any high-grade um, new um, risk that we've seen in, in earlier line patients. Um, and the most common side effects were hematological, uh, mostly neutropenia, which again, for most patients resolves after three months. And then the non-hematologic, you know, course infections, things like that, especially in the first three to six months, we do have to be careful, but the majority of these patients over time um, improved and we didn't see any major grade three, four non-heme tox. And CRS and I, um, neurotoxicity, again, you know, this is actually a little bit better than what we see in the late line patients um, and um, overall acceptable toxicity. Um, there were not any Parkinsonism um, reports, and so we were um, happy to see that. Um, but again, you know, long-term follow-up is still needed to make sure secondary cancers, et cetera, which we don't have a, a major um, signal um, as of now, but something to look out for. <clears throat> so in summary, you know, the KARMA-3 study did enroll a high-risk triple class exposed um, in highly refractory population. And again, DARA tumumab, 95% um, of these patients had had DARA and were refractory. Um, in this subgroup analysis, a single infusion of Ida cell treatment consistently demonstrated meaningful improvement in both PFS and overall response rates versus standard regimens, regardless of their baseline disease characteristics. Um, nadir levels of soluble BCMA, which we do believe is a uh, you know, pharmacodynamic marker of um, tumor clearance, um, were lower in the patients who got Ida cell versus standard regimens, both at nadir and at progression. And the toxicity profile of Ida cell in high risk subgroups was really manageable and consistent with the overall population. Um, and again, no Parkinsonianism was reported. And really, I think the study shows the benefit of Ida cell versus most of our standard regimens that are available um, in Karma 3, 
which was maintained across patient populations with difficult to treat high risk multiple myeloma. And I think these are the patients that we can't get in fifth line. So if we get early approvals based on this trial and some of the other trials that have been presented recently, um, I really think we'll be able to improve access for some of our most vulnerable patient populations. So with that, um, just thank you to our patients and their families, and of course, the clinical study teams that helped with the study and all the investigators um, that were involved.